If you find the channel educational and or entertaining, please consider supporting us for as little as $1 a month. The link will be pinned in the comments. Thank you. To most of you watching this video, the disease of cholera will likely conjure images of smoky Victorian streets and a disease of years gone by. But for many in the developing world, it is a disease that persists in the absence of clean drinking water and sanitation. To this day, there are still upwards of 4 million cases of cholera a year, with as many as 140,000 deaths a year, and a great many of these will be children. In today's video, we will cover how the cholera bacteria affects a person, a history of our understanding of the disease, and what more needs to be done to combat it. Cholera is caused by the Vibra cholerae bacteria. Specifically, only two strains of the bacteria will produce the toxins that cause the cholera illness to manifest, these being the O1 and the 0139 variants. The bacteria can be found in shallow, brackish water, and although it is not hosted in animals, it can live on chitinous plankton and shellfish. Transmission of the disease will occur when a person consumes food or water contaminated with the bacteria, namely shellfish. Human-to-human -human transmission is possible through the fecal-oral route, usually whereby an infected person's stool containing the bacteria contaminates a drinking water source. Once a person ingests the bacteria, in most instances, it will be destroyed in the stomach acid, with most experiencing mild symptoms. Around 10% of people infected will experience the severe symptoms that, if untreated, will result in a mortality rate of between 25 and 50%. Cholera is a gastrointestinal illness, meaning it infects a person's intestines. Once it reaches the intestines, the toxins produced by the bacteria will cause the excretion of huge amounts of water that will lead to diarrhea. Those suffering with the severe cases of cholera will experience incredibly watery and frequent diarrhea, which is often described as rice water due to its consistency and colour. In some instances, a patient will also vomit, though this is rarer. With the large amount of fluids lost, a patient will become dehydrated, and this is where the danger lies. If a patient receives no treatment, they can become severely dehydrated which can lead to shock, then becoming comatose, and even death in only a matter of hours. For those who are also experiencing frequent vomiting, there is a risk of pneumonia due to the constant aspiration. There are those more at risk of contracting cholera, such as those with O blood groups and those with lower gastric acidity. But by far, those greatest at risk are people who live without access to decent sanitation and clean drinking water. Human waste, containing the cholera bacteria, once in a drinking source, can prove to be disastrous. Sewerage and water processing remove the bacteria from the cycles of infection. As for treating those affected, it is vital that they receive fluids. This can be done orally or through an IV if the patient is also vomiting. It is vital that the patient is rehydrated and that they receive electrolytes to replenish those that are lost. This intervention proves to be incredibly effective, with survival rates as high as 99%. In some instances, antibiotics are used to help combat the disease, but rehydration therapy is by far the most effective. The first cholera pandemic can be traced to the Bay of Bengal in the early 19th century. In 1817, the cholera bacteria affected the region's rice fields and was able to spread beyond India to Thailand, the Philippines, Myanmar and Sri Lanka along the trade routes. Hundreds of thousands died to this new illness, reaching as far as Turkey. The first pandemic raged for seven years before withdrawing, but subsequent pandemics would reach Europe, America, Russia and the Middle East. It's understood that cholera landed in Great Britain through the port of Sunderland in late 1831. The British government implemented quarantines and established local boards of health to try and manage the disease, but still, thousands died. In the face of this new disease, misinformation became widespread, particularly from misleading media reports, which seemed to suggest that more people died in hospitals than at home. Some started to believe that the poor were being taken away, murdered, and their corpses used for anatomical dissection. 
a rumour that was able to be spread due to the recent Herrenberg murders where the bodies of their victims were used for such medical purposes. This even resulted in a number of cholera riots, notably in Liverpool. By the end of the first British cholera epidemic, some 52,000 people had died, which was a huge number for the times. Her second epidemic in 1848 claimed a further 53,000 people, but there was soon a shift in how the disease would be dealt with. It was through the works and influence of social reformers, namely Edwin Chadwick, that matters started to improve. One of the key reasons for the spread of cholera was due to the overcrowded and unsanitary conditions for many living in urban, industrial Britain. Thousands moved from the countryside to the ever-growing towns to work in the factories. Housing shortages led to the overcrowded conditions, with communal water pumps, toilets and nothing in the way of decent sewerage. Such conditions were perfect for the spread of cholera, and in 1842 Chadwick published his research paper, titled The Sanitary Conditions of the Labouring Population. In this research paper, Chadwick showed a direct link to the squalid conditions of the working classes and the spread of cholera. Chadwick asserted that in order to improve public health, there needed to be improved drainage, the removal of all waste from the areas where people lived, and access to clean drinking water. Whilst he suggested improvements to benefit the health of the working people, Chadwick's belief was in part misguided. Chadwick, as did many people at the time, believed in the miasma theory for how diseases spread. It was believed that the foul odours carried the cholera disease, and so by pumping away the foul-smelling waste from the people, their health would improve. Unfortunately, Chadwick's improvements to the sewage and drainage systems would end up dumping raw sewage into the River Thames, the main source of drinking water for the people of London. The cholera-infected waste further contaminated the drinking water of more and more Londoners, leading to more cholera deaths. All was not lost, however, as such sewage works were a step in the right direction. In 1848, the first Board of Health was established with Chadwick appointed as Commissioner. This Board of Health was put in place by the 1848 Public Health Act, which sought to increase the role that the government played in ensuring the public's health, building sewers and paving the way for a healthier country. But the breakthrough came with the intervention of Dr John Snow, the man considered to be one of the founders of modern epidemiology. In 1854, the third cholera outbreak struck London. Whilst sewers were being built, Soho, at this point in time, had not yet benefited from the building programmes. This area of London was disproportionately hit by cholera, some 600 people in the space of just a few weeks. Dr Snow mapped the cases of cholera and carried out investigations in the area. He was able to pinpoint the outbreak in Soho to a particular water pump in Broad Street. Dr Snow's investigation was able to have the water pump shut down, which resulted in the outbreak waning. Despite Snow's evidence, his findings were largely dismissed. Many were not prepared to hear that the fecal oral route for disease transmission was valid. It was not until 1866 when Dr. William Farr, who had previously dismissed Snow's work, came to the same conclusions, and the findings of the Broad Street study were accepted. Also in 1854, Italian doctor Filippo Pacini identified the cholera bacteria. He had studied the intestinal mucosa of a recently deceased cholera victim and discovered the bacteria within. Cholera came to Florence in 1854, during the Asiatic cholera pandemic of 1846-63. Pacini became very interested in the disease. Immediately following the death of cholera patients, he performed an autopsy with his microscope, conducting examinations of the intestinal mucosa. During such studies, Pacini first discovered a coma-shaped bacillus, which he later described as a vibrio. Pacini published his paper in 1854, titled microscopical observations and pathological deductions on cholera. Here, he described the organism and asserted that it was responsible for the disease. Although, his work went unrecognised. Even though he correctly identified the benefits of salt and fluid therapy to combat the disease and stressed the contagious nature of the disease, he was widely dismissed. 
It was not until some 30 years later, when independent of Pacini's work, did Robert Koch, a name that should be familiar to those who have watched our other disease videos, identified the cholera bacteria in 1884. As the Western world improved its drainage and sanitation networks, the threat of cholera started to decrease. For example, during the sixth cholera pandemic, Western Europe was largely unaffected, whereas less developed and politically tumultuous Russia fared far worse. In India, some 800,000 people died over the course of 20 years. By the seventh pandemic in 1961, the disparity between the developed and developing world grew even starker. Today, there is an ongoing effort to reduce the impact of cholera by 90% by 2030. Cholera remains endemic in a number of countries, where access to clean drinking water and sanitation is not widely available. There is a current outbreak in Yemen brought on by the displacement of millions of people due to the ongoing conflict. Nigeria and the Democratic Republic of Congo have the highest number of cases, but deaths are on a downward trend. Cholera is an easily treated disease, but there is a requirement of decent infrastructure to rob the disease of its transmission routes. As can be seen in the outbreak in Yemen, the disease can take hold during times of strife and where people are without access to clean water and sanitation. The risk of cholera will remain where poverty, war or natural disasters result in people living in unsanitary crowded conditions. Cholera for now remains a threat to those without access to what many of us take for granted. It almost feels like a relic of a bygone time, and yet it is still a reality for many. Whilst we have a far better understanding of the disease and its cause, there are still far too many deaths for a disease so easily treated and prevented. As is often the case in these disease videos, it is hard to ignore the disparity caused by poverty and its impact on those who suffer the most from such diseases. There will be plenty of links in the description for those who wish to read a little bit further into this disease.